The King in His Kingdom, Jesus in the Book of Matthew. This is lesson number five. And if you're going to follow along with your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open them to Matthew chapter 10. That's where we're going to take our, our lesson. As you know, we're not following Matthew. You know, we're not doing chapter 9, 10, 11, 12, so on and so forth. We're selecting uh, different lessons or different passages in Matthew to highlight uh, what Matthew is doing here. We're studying the person of Jesus in the book of Matthew, where Matthew emphasizes Jesus' royalty over other aspects of his character and, uh, and his ministry. So far, Matthew has demonstrated or shown Jesus uh, as he was worshiped as a king by the wise men, even as a baby, you know, as a newborn, we see Jesus being worshiped by um, uh, individuals that demonstrate his uh, kingly position. He's seen as a threat by the evil king. You know, the, 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 the good guys are worshiping, the bad guys are trying to kill him. You know, so that there's something special about him from the very beginning. He's been shown as Lord over both Satan and the angels by defeating one and being ministered to by the, other, by the others uh, during his time in the desert. We've heard the king describe the nature and the experience of his kingdom as he explains it in the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus talking about the kingdom itself. And then our last lesson, we observe the king as he went about establishing his will. Remember we said the kingdom is where the will of God is being completed. So we, we, we see where the kingdom is being established in the hearts of people. And uh, this is done through the teaching and through the miracles that he performs. We also watched as Jesus the King, through his teaching and miracles, call those around him into his kingdom to become disciples. So lots of action um, in these first uh, several uh, chapters. So in today's lesson, uh, we're going to see the natural progression of the King's work on behalf of the kingdom, and that is to prepare and send out his disciples to go and preach the good news about the kingdom and invite others to also enter in. So you, know, you can see the pattern here. He goes out and he does it. He succeeds at it. He demonstrates how it's done, calling people into the kingdom. He explains what the kingdom is. And then what does he do? Well, he sends out his disciples to go out and do exactly the same thing. You know, he demonstrates it teaches it, and then he puts others uh, to the task. It's the same thing today, right? We grow up, we learn, we learn the Bible, so on and so forth, then it's our turn to teach others who will teach others, and so on and so forth. Now, the title of this lesson is The Kingdom in Conflict. And the reason for this is that uh, so far there's been no opposition to the Lord and His preaching. Everything is going along you know, rather fine. The initial beginnings of bringing people into the kingdom has been joyful, it has been peaceful, people are rejoicing, it's a wonderful thing. But when he sends out his disciples to preach the message and he forces people to choose to come in or remain out of the kingdom, in other words, you know, he's saying, you have a choice here. You either come into the kingdom or you're out for good. You, know, he, you can't just be neutral about this thing. The moment that that happens, then the opposition to the disciples and the kingdom and its king begins to, uh, begins to happen. And so in the passage that we're going to cover today, we're going to see Jesus preparing His messengers of the kingdom for the conflicts that they will suffer. So there's the preamble. Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse one, Jesus says, or, or Matthew says, Jesus summoned His 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. So Matthew answers the readers um, uh, to know the 12 special uh, disciples of Jesus. Uh, we know that he had a lot of disciples and he sent out more than 12 with power. In Luke chapter 10 verse 4 we read that he sent 70 out. However, this section deals specifically with the sending out of the 12 who were to become the chosen um, apostles. And he gives them authority. Um, the term here, authority, means power and the right to use that power. 
that's authority. Like the government has authority. It has power and it has also the right to make laws and to punish criminals and so on and so forth. Well, in the same way, the apostles had the authority. They had the power and they had the right to use that power. And also they had the right to demonstrate Jesus' deity as one with the ability to give spiritual power to another one. That's a real mark of deity, isn't it? Not only that you are able to make miracles, you are able to do signs and wonders, but that you have the ability to give someone else that power. That's truly a sign of, um, of deity. So the power is over the spiritual realm, the fact that they can cast out demons, and also the physical realm, that they could heal sickness and disease. Uh, we go on in uh, chapter 10, he names the 12. He says, now the names of the 12 apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, and James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. Now the term apostle means more than just a servant or someone sent to deliver a message. It denotes a fully empowered representative or legate who acts for the, his Lord or King. So it's, an, it's kind of an official title. It's an official title. Someone sent by a king, for example, with the responsibility to deliver a message. Same idea here. Sometimes the word is used to refer to those who helped the apostles, like Barnabas, for example. But when referred to as the 12 apostles, the Bible speaks of these special messengers uh, who had special work to do. For example, it was through these 12 apostles that the eyewitness account of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus was first proclaimed, but not just proclaimed, proclaimed with power. There's a difference. There were some who were going out saying, you know, I think that, that guy over there, that's Jesus. We heard him, the Sermon on the Mount. He, we saw some miracles that he did. There were people like that. But the apostles not only pointed people towards Jesus, they could do miracles. And so their um, witness, if you wish, was empowered uh, by the ability to do miracles. Also, they were the ones through whom the church was established. Nobody else was going around establishing the church other than the apostles at the beginning. And they were also the ones through whom Jesus' instructions or teachings were recorded or confirmed for future generations. There were 14 apostles in all. Uh, here there are 12, but there are uh, others. Uh, Judas was replaced by Matthias, and Paul, of course, was called as an apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, and there will not be any others like this. There are some groups, you know, who call their leaders, ministers, preachers, they call them apostles. You know, I'm, I'm Apostle Jerry, you know, or I'm, I'm Apostle uh, Diane. You know, I've, I've heard people refer to themselves in that way in other religious groups. Well, they can call themselves apostles, but unless, you, unless you're an eyewitness of the, you know, the birth, the life, the resurrection of Jesus, unless you're able to do miracles, unless you were specifically called by Jesus, you know, you're not an apostle in the way these were apostles. So let's look at how they're you know, grouped. The list is grouped in pairs. One thing interesting, every time the apostles are mentioned, the first one I mentioned is always Peter, and Judas is always last. Um, gives Peter's Jewish name, which is Simon. Uh, Andrew, Peter's brother, is listed with him. James and John, another set of brothers, are listed. Philip and Bartholomew, uh, Bartholomew sometimes referred to as Nathaniel, you know, goes back and forth. Uh, let's see, uh, Thomas, of course, we call him Doubting Thomas. We, uh, we understand why he doubted uh, the resurrection of Jesus. Matthew, the uh, tax collector or the publican. Uh, a second James here and Thaddeus. Thaddeus also referred to as uh, Lebeus or Judas. He had other names, that's why it gets confusing sometimes. So one person had different, different names he was referred to as. A second Simon, this one was from Canaan. Peter was from Galilee. Uh, he was a zealot, he was a member of a sect. A member of a sect who believed in overthrowing the government through 
insurrection. He was a zealot. He was a guerrilla fighter. He was a terrorist, okay? Simon the Zealot. And then of course, Judas is last. Iscariot means man of Kerioth. Kerioth was his hometown in the area of Judea. Uh, and he was designated as a traitor. Now the same names are found in other lists and they're, they're kind of, the order is changed a little bit, but Peter's always first, Judas is always last. And so Jesus provides uh, instructions concerning their mission um, in uh, verses five to 42. I'm not going to read all of that. Uh, these instructions contain information pertaining to their immediate mission in Galilee. He sends them to Galilee. He doesn't send them all over the world, he sends them to Galilee, but also a wider view of their mission to all the world later on as to how it would be received and their own reaction to the response of those who they would bring the gospel to. In other words, Jesus is saying, not only do what I did, I give you power and authority to go out and preach the gospel, He also tells them, and this is how people are going to react when you go out and do your work. And then He tells them, and this is how you're going to react to their reaction. Okay, so he, he, he really lays it all out for them. So their ministry to Israel, Jesus begins by giving them instructions concerning the immediate ministry to the Jews. So let's read that. It says, these 12 Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles and do not enter any city of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. Freely you received, freely give. Do not acquire gold or silver or copper for your money belts or a bag for your journey or even two coats or sandals or a staff for the worker is worthy of his support. So what does he tell them? Let's break it down. First of all, go only to Jews, not Gentiles, not Samaritans. The gospel and the kingdom is established first among the Jews and then to spread to all parts of the world. We know about that in Acts chapter one and Romans one. And some people say, why, why is that? Why do the Jews first? First of all, just because of their own limitations and experience, they start off you know, pretty much close to home. But more importantly, because this was according to prophecy. This was according to God's instruction, God's plan. God had promised that the Jews would be the first ones to receive the Messiah, the news of the Messiah. It was their reward for having you know, kept the seed of promise throughout the, throughout the centuries. So go only to the Jews, for now anyways. And here's what you're going to preach. Preach that the kingdom of God is at hand. So this was to be the theme of their proclamation. The idea was that the rule of grace, the power and the promises of God made to them in the Old Testament were about to be fulfilled. Their true king, their true divine Messiah was here. When, when they preached the kingdom is at hand, these are the type of thoughts that their audiences would have. And of course, they were to continue the message of John the Baptist. That's what John the Baptist was preaching. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the apostles, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Why? Well, because Jesus has not died on the cross, not been resurrected yet, so we were still preaching this, uh, this message. Next, they were given power to perform miracles, healing the sick, raising the dead, casting out demons. They received this ability for free and they were to use them for the benefit of the people for free. The reason for this is to be a great temptation to sell this kind of power, to capitalize on this type of ability. Their uh, ability to do miracles was given to them to confirm the word that they were preaching, to show Jesus' authority. In other words, when they're saying, Jesus, you know, the kingdom is here, Jesus in the, is the Messiah, and someone says, oh yeah, well, lots of people going around saying that. Well, wait a minute, let me heal you of your leprosy here. Let me take care of that blindness. How about I resurrect your dead child? Will you believe me now? You know, basically, that, that was the reason. The miracles were there to confirm the word. Also, he would tell them what to bring and what not to bring. They were to bring no money, no luggage, no extra clothing, no shoes or staffs. 
They were to go as they were. Jesus sends them out with the base physical necessities and He assures them that as His workers He will provide for them on their journey. Very impractical, isn't it? You're sending guys out. Now they're, going, they're not going you know, 5,000 miles away. They're going into their region, maybe a day or two days you know, walk, if you wish. But still, nothing. So this instruction is part of their training. You know, he's trained them how to preach. He's trained them, you know, he's, he's demonstrated miracles and so on and so forth. But the thing they have to learn is to actually depend on him even for the base necessities of life, food and where they'll stay and so on and so forth. The king had the power and the resources to provide for their work on his behalf. And then we have the method of operation, verses 11 to 15. He says, in whatever city or village you enter, inquire who is worthy in it and stay at his house until you leave that city. As you enter the house, give it your greeting. If the house is worthy, give it your blessing of peace. But if it is not worthy, take back your blessing of peace. Whoever does not receive you nor heed your words, as you go out of that house or that city, shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So they're to preach, right? They're to preach and do their works and determine by the response who is willing to accommodate them. Remember, Jesus did miracles. Jesus you know, resurrected Lazarus from the dead and a lot of people who were standing there who saw that particular miracle, the first thing that they thought was, man, we got to get rid of this guy, he's dangerous. Not oh, how wonderful God is. So uh, Jesus is you know, telling them, just because you do all of this stuff doesn't mean people will accept you. You know, it's the same today. The, the church is active in so many ways, trying to do things you know, right, helping here, preaching the gospel, so on and so forth. And sometimes you know, we hear people say, I, I don't know why they don't get it. Don't they see we, we want the best for them? We, we're, we're only preaching the gospel. We're not asking for money. There's no manipulation. It's just, and yet people sometimes just will not respond. All I'm saying to that is, well, that's nothing new. Nothing, you know, oh well. Because in the time of Jesus, the apostles were actually making miracles and still people were not responsive to what they were doing. And so uh, they were to preach to those who are willing to hear. When they enter, they are to offer a greeting of peace and if the hosts are receptive of Christ, this blessing will remain upon the house. If not, the apostles will leave and the blessing will return to them. You know, sometimes the problem is not uh, to begin preaching or sharing with someone. Sometimes it's knowing when to quit. That's the hard part. It's not hard to know, well, I ought to share my faith with this person or that person, my mother, my uncle, whatever, my brother-in-law. It's when do I stop? Well, Jesus said when, when the blessing, you know, they don't accept the blessing. There are people in my family who have said, you know, you know what, the Bible, I'll tell you what, you know, when I want to hear it, you know, when I want you to open it up and read it to me, I'll let you know. And I said, OK. To me, that was my blessing just came back to me. Maybe like a slap in the head, but it came back to me. You know what I'm saying? And that, and that was like, OK. OK. So long as someone is willing to hear, uh, I had a question about that thing. You, know, you go to church, you read the Bible, don't you? Hey, answer me that question. Hey, great, let's talk. You know? But when you get a response like, you know what? Keep it to yourself, like that, famous, that new popular West, uh, you know, country western song, keep it to yourself. You know? When I get that attitude, when I get that feedback, well then I do keep it to myself. And then they say, he says to them, uh, blessings of peace will guide them. You'll know who's respect, uh, who, who, who is respective of the message. My job as a preacher is not to go out the, to talk to people who don't want to hear. My job is to find those people who want to hear it, but haven't found it yet. There are plenty of those people out there, believe me, plenty of people out there who have not heard the gospel, who don't know the Bible, and who want to hear it. It's just no one's come to them. Those are the people I'm looking for. 
I'm not looking for those sore heads you know, who just want to get up and fight with me and debate with me and think they're smart and they know it. They never read the Bible, but they know everything about the Bible. You know what I'm saying? Hey, talk to yourself. I, I, I'm out to, you know, my time is running short on this earth. I'm looking for the people who are looking. Those are the people I want to find. And then it says, if this occurs, they're to leave and as a sign that they have been there and been rejected, they're to shake the dust off that place, off of themselves as a sign of the rejection that they have suffered. Now, they have actually been there in the homes with the gospel, ready to preach, but they were rejected. So they, they, they shake it off in the same way the dust falls off. It's a symbolic thing. Jesus reminds them of the judgment reserved for those who reject or shake off the message. You know, he says, you're not judging them, the Word's going to judge them. You're, you're there trying to tell them there's a judgment coming, there's a train heading your way. You need to get out of the way, you need to be saved. If they say, hey, you know, I don't want to hear it, okay. Then there's a warning as to the response of the people in verses 16 to 23. Jesus warns them as the to the response that they're going to receive, not only from the Jews, but also the response that they'll receive as they bring the gospel beyond Israel later on, after he's gone. And this is a warning of the conflict to come. So here's some of the things that he says. First of all, he says, when you preach, you know, later on, when you go out and preach to the whole world, people will not take happily to the message. Verse 16 to 18, he says, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves, but beware of men, for they will hand you over to the courts and scourge you in their synagogues, and you will even be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. So the true nature of the world, sheep and wolves, and the need to be harmless but wise. A sheep is, you know, but you, you know when there's danger. They will be in some, in some cases brought before lower courts, you know, the Jewish courts, and higher courts, the governors and the kings, because of the gospel. And in doing so, they'll cause even the leaders in the world to hear and examine the message of Christ. Paul before kings, preached before kings, didn't he? So he says, you know, you're happy. You're overjoyed seeing the power that you have and the gospel is here and the Messiah is here. You're happy, but don't think your happiness is going to translate into other people's happiness when they hear the gospel. Then a word of reassurance, he says, Jesus will provide for them in their hour of trial. Verse 19, he says, but when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given to you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Now realize here, he's not promising to protect them against imprisonment or torture or even death, which they all suffered. He's not promising that. He's promising to inspire them in their proclamation and defense of the gospel through the Holy Spirit. When the time comes, they may be persecuted, but they won't be confused. There's a difference, isn't there? They may be harmed, but they won't be confused as to the message. And so he promises, I'll be with you in that. And then he talks about the result. There will be results. He says, um, brother will betray brother to death and a father his child and a children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly, I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. So the gospel is going to bring division within families. Well, I think I could point to people here and say, yeah, sure. It certainly happened in my family. You know, in my family, they didn't get it. They thought I was a married priest. They, thought they didn't quite understand what was going on. OK, so you, you're working for the church, but you're married. How does that work? You know, that was the best, they, the best that they ever understood was I was some kind of married, married priest or something. Yeah. So it'll divide families. Because I, I know this because I remember whenever there was a big family gathering and everybody was happy, when I walked in, everything, whoosh, everything calmed down. You know what I'm saying? 
I remember once at Christmas, you know, all the family was there and my niece brought home a new boyfriend, you know, a nice young man, and he was trying to make an impression, you know, and blah, 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 and he comes sit next, next to me and he's going to be very generous and open. And he says, well, you know, you're her, her uncle. Yeah, yeah. And said, what do you do? I said, I'm a minister. And it's like he put his foot in it. It was like, oh, I could see the look on his face. Oh, no, oh, please. <laughs> And he just couldn't get out of that conversation fast enough. Wait, I think I need more orange juice, you know, I mean. Or on a plane, you know. Well, that's a double-edged sword on the plane. Either the person, if you say, oh, I'm a minister, they'll like, oh, you know, and then go to sleep. Or they got a thousand questions, so they, there's, no, you know, there's no winning on that one. Uh, he tells them they will be persecuted because of Christ and the message that they bring and the result that it causes. And then what does he say? Only those who persevere will be saved. It's not the call to apostleship that saves them, but faithfulness. Notice this, he's talking to apostles. It isn't the fact that you've been given miraculous powers or you know, I'm sending you out to preach the gospel that'll save you. What will save you is if you're faithful. Oh, wait a minute, isn't that the same thing for us? We've not been called as apostles. None of us can do miracles, right? So we have the same standard, those who are faithful until death, and faithfulness despite persecution to the end. You know, some people, like, some people have quit Christianity, all right, because they didn't like the preacher. Or because, I don't know, you know, when they had a baby, somebody didn't have a shower for them. You know, just crazy reasons or so-and-so didn't say hello, or they didn't feel you know, that the church was treating them right in the way they should be, and for this reason they quit. They quit following the Lord. And when I read this passage, you'll be scourged and beaten and imprisoned and ripped, torn apart and cut in half. And, you know. But if you, if you persevere through all of that, you'll be saved. And I'm thinking, man, if you have to persevere through all of that, what is that guy who says, oh, well, the elders didn't come visit me and when I had my appendix out, so I quit. How does that guy going to do? You see what I'm saying? The small slings and arrows that we suffer in the church. You know, you put 400 sinners together in a church, there's bound to be somebody who's going to offend you, you know, at least of which the preacher. Because he's got to talk to you about what? About your sins. <laughs> so obviously, people have got to get hurt feelings in the church. It's, it's, it's a package deal. So he prophesizes that the destruction of the Jewish nation, which will come in 70 AD, when Rome attacks Jerusalem, will occur before they'll be able to bring the news to all the towns. When he says the Son of Man refers to, when he talks about himself as the Son of Man, he talks, he's talking in terms of judgment. So in the Bible, you know, Jesus talks about judgment in two, two ways. Judgment that happens, you know, during their lifetime and then the final judgment. You have to understand in context which he's talking about. All right, need to move. So then he goes on and gives instructions on their response to the people's reaction to the gospel. First of all, he says, uh, all these things happening to you, don't be surprised. A disciple is not above his teacher nor a slave above his master. It's enough for the disciple that he become like his teacher and the slave like his master. If they have called the head of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign the members of his household? So don't be surprised, he says. Don't be surprised if they treat you as they treated me. They accused me of being the devil himself. Imagine what they're going to say about you, sinful men, weak men. You know? If they call the one without sin the devil, well, what do you think they're going to call you? What kind of accusations are you going to have? So don't be surprised. You can be hurt, that's a normal thing, and you can be you know, afraid of pain, that's normal, but surprised, no, no, you, you must never be surprised. Like I'm never surprised with the sins that people do. Never, never surprised. Because human beings are able to do all kinds of terrible, sinful things. Even Christians, I'm never surprised. People say, well, I need to talk to you. We need to visit for a while. You know, I got something on my heart. You know, usually that means, uh-oh, I've messed up. 
And then most of the time, the hard part is to, to, to kind of confide in me what's happened. And I tell them, you can't tell me anything that I have never heard before. Did you molest a child? Heard it. You cheat on your wife? Heard it. Killed somebody? Heard it. I've heard it. I've met people who've done, broken all the commandments. You can't surprise me. You can't surprise me. So don't be surprised at the sinfulness of the world and how it reacts to the gospel. Number two, or we continue, he says, don't be afraid. Therefore do not fear them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will, be, will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So do not fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. So he says, don't be afraid of failure. Everything that is secret now, their schemes and your gospel will one day be revealed and it will be out in the open. Don't be afraid of death, he says. They may kill your bodies, but, un, but they cannot destroy your souls, which are precious in the sight of the Father. The worst thing man can do to you is kill your body. Can I have no power over your soul? And he says, and don't be afraid of being wrong. Isn't that unusual that he says that? Don't be afraid of being wrong. Those who confess Christ, they're on God's side. Those who deny Christ, they're the ones who are against God. Now that sounds like an unusual thing, but look out there in the world. The ones who deny that Christ is the Son of God, who are they? Well, they're the rich most of the time. They're the ones we, we kind of admire because they're famous and they're smart and urbane and you know, they're the movie stars and the the, the, not all, of course, but you know what I'm saying. The, the, those people, they're the ones that kind of control the media and they're the ones that think that Christians are you know, poor souls. He says, Jesus said, don't be afraid of being wrong. You're, you're on the right side. Now here on earth, you always seem to be on the wrong side, but trust me, he says, you're on the right, you're on the right side. Don't be afraid. Then he makes a comment on the reasons for the negative response to the to the gospel itself in verses 34. First of all, he says, um, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. So he says, the gospel is going to bring division, not unity. The gospel brings peace between God and man but it promotes peace among brethren, but it creates a natural dividing line between those who accept it and those who reject it. Your best friend in the world, you know, both of you are running together, your best friend in the world, and then one day you obey the gospel and you begin to follow Christ as a disciple. And that, your best friend, buddy, you know, whatever, they don't, they don't accept Christ. Well, you're going to have trouble keeping that relationship going for a very long time. Because you're heading in another direction. There's division there. Secondly, he says the gospel demands, the, you know, why do people react this way? Because the, the gospel demands loyalty, the highest kind of loyalty. He says, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. And so a loyalty that puts Christ above the closest of physical relationships, even above the preservation of self, that's what he's asking for. Jesus explains that the negative response that they're going to encounter shouldn't surprise them or frighten them because it's normal. 
The gospel is exclusive and it demands total commitment from those that it calls. That's the big problem today. We want to take the exclusivity out of Christianity. In other words, the door is open, everybody come in. You're baptized, great. You're not baptized, who cares? Come on in. You believe Jesus is the actual Son of God? Terrific. You don't think Jesus is the Son of God, maybe a good teacher or something? Come on in, it don't matter. Because what's important is that everybody is acceptable. Well, <laughs> that may be somebody's gospel, but that's not the gospel that's preached from the Bible. <laughs> the gospel preached from the Bible is very exclusive. Why does he say the door is narrow and few who, who be who find it? And so that's one of the reasons for the rejection. It's so exclusive. So those who reject it say to the people who accept it, who do you think you are? You think you're better than me and so on and so forth. That's, that's the reaction that it gets. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, will I abandon everything, including myself, to follow Jesus? You see, it's exclusive in the sense that there is no other way except through Jesus Christ and obedience to only Him that we can be saved. You know, a good Hindu obeying all the Hindu stuff, according to the gospel, cannot be saved. And I can just change that word in there. So that's the problem with the, uh, that's the, problem with the, with the, uh, the gospel, or rather that's the problem people have with the gospel. And then finally, a promise uh, to those who, um, uh, who do respond in 40, I think I've lost my overhead there, it says, I'll just read it for you, he says, he who receives you receives me, and he who receives me receives him who sent me. And he who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. So he finishes out this section by first of all explaining what they're going to do, what they're going to say, how people are going to respond to them. Then he explains how they should respond to the response that they got. And then he explains why people respond that way. And then he finishes by making a promise to all of those who respond. And the promise is of a reward to not only those who receive the message from the mouth of the apostles, but also even the ones who received the message far down the line, and once again Jesus is talking about, about us. Not just those who respond directly to the apostles, but all those who ultimately will respond to their message will be blessed. And here, as I say, He is talking to, he's talking to us. So we've got three minutes, let me just wrap this up here. We see the king preparing his servants for the the, the task at hand, to announce on his behalf the establishment of his kingdom among men. It's already established in heaven, right? Because the, the Jesus prays, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom exists in heaven. It's being established here. Why? Because here there's disobedience. No disobedience up in heaven. He calls them, He equips them with power, He instructs them as to what their mission is and how to accomplish it, and then He ends with a warning about obstacles and an encouragement concerning their reward. So Jesus the King does the same thing with us today. He calls us and He adds us to His kingdom, the church, through the gospel, Acts chapter two. He equips us with the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. He instructs us about our mission and the strategy uh, that we're supposed to use. Matthew 28, you know, go out into all the world, preach the gospel, baptizing uh, the believers in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit, right? He tells us how to do it. And he provides us encouragement and warnings through the church and its teachings. So in this way, the king continues to send out his servants to announce the good news of the kingdom. So we need to remember two last things what he told the apostles about dealing with the conflicts that come with sharing our faith. Two things. A, don't be surprised. If they treated Jesus badly, if they treated the apostles badly, why would you think they treat us any better in sharing the gospel? And B, don't be afraid. He encouraged the apostles to not be afraid concerning failure and death and being wrong 
and He promises us the exact same thing. All right, well that's our lesson for uh, today. Next week, a parable about the growth of the kingdom, and if you'd like to stay uh, you know, uh, abreast of the, uh, the lessons. We don't always read all the passages. I'd encourage you to read Matthew chapter 12 and 13, and at least you'll be familiar with the material. All right, thank you very much. That's it for our class today.